right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Mitch, um, and it is time to get started. So welcome to our program, to our Indigenous film program. My name is Mitch Slevik from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I'll be your sort of behind the scenes host tonight. Uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management for tonight's event and our ongoing film series. Um, throughout the program, please put any questions or comments you have in the chat. And you won't see each other's chats, but we will be keeping an eye on the chat the whole night. Um, and we'll gather all those and save the questions for the end. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce Jean Rubin and the director of the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Take it away, Jean. Thank you, Mitch. Welcome, everybody. This is our 18th annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Uh, now that we're virtual, we have a, an extended schedule. So uh, this is one in our series of films. So glad you could join us. With me is Murph Tano. He is president of the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. I'm so glad you could join us. Our program tonight is about the Awahi Forest Restoration Project. As always, I like to start the program by acknowledging our sponsors uh, and all the people we need to thank. Uh, it's a collaborative effort and without all of our sponsors and partners and friends, we couldn't make this happen. So first, uh, a thank you to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. They have been hosting festival events for many years as in theater events. And when we had to transition to a virtual festival, uh, they just made it seamless and we didn't miss a beat. So thank you DMNS for all you do for us. Uh, you, you saw Mitch on screen and there's so many people uh, that you don't see uh, that are not in front of the camera that, that make this happen. So thank you to everybody at DMNS. And of course, we could not bring you the festival without the support of our sponsors. Our, our major sponsors this year are the National Endowment for the Arts, Kanika Minolta and AARP. You saw their logos scrolling on the screen as you logged in. You also saw our community partner logos. Community partners play many roles from uh, hosting events to outreach to helping us identify speakers. Uh, I want to comment uh, and thank two in particular, Kumulao Foundation and Niuli'i Foundation, who are co-sponsoring tonight's presentation. And I'd like to just tell you a little bit about how we uh, came to uh, develop tonight's program for you. Last March, Merv organized a virtual talk by Dr. Art Medeiros, who's program manager of the Oahe Forest Restoration Project. We thought it would be of interest to Colorado's Native Hawaiian community, and we had a small group online to watch. And I have to tell you, it was fantastic. Art is an engaging speaker. He had beautiful slides. It was interesting. I learned so much. And my first thought was, wow, what a great program. And my second thought was, we've got to bring this to DMNS because it just felt like such a perfect program for the museum. And we were looking for the right moment to do that and connecting with the temporary exhibit, Survival of the Slowest, felt to us like the right moment. So um, we're going to start tonight's program with a sneak peek of a film. It's still under production. It's going to be a 19 minute film. Um, and we were very fortunate that the Oahe Forest Restoration Project is letting us give you a sneak peek. They have a three minute trailer. Uh, it's wonderful and you will learn more than you thought you ever could learn in three minutes. But after the three minutes, we will be back and you'll learn even more uh, with Art Medeiros. So with that, uh, let's roll the film. Aloha, everyone. Um, as Jean said, I'm Merv Tano. I uh, head up the uh, International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. I I've been working uh, with Indian tribes and uh, indigenous peoples uh, since uh, about the mid-70s. 
um, mostly with Indian tribes uh, uh, back in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, uh, working for the Administration for Native Americans. And one of the things that uh, working with the Indian tribes uh, uh, around, for example, uh, forestry uh, management uh, is that you start uh, learning how forestry is being defined by, by the bureaucrats. And for the bureaucrats, forestry management is about stumpage. It's how much you can uh, harvest uh, from, the, from the forest. And what I loved about Art and his work, which I learned uh, of, of his work on that uh, on, on Facebook, uh, is that there's a guy uh, whose work uh, is, is, is dedicated to the, the proposition that, that forests are a heck of a lot more than trees. They're a heck of a lot more than timber. And, and so I uh, started communicating with him and uh, uh, he, he, I, I would recommend you, you, you look at uh, his, his website and if you connect with him on, on Facebook, because every time he shows up on Facebook uh, with some images of his volunteers uh, planting trees and other vegetation. And when I see the difference between the land that he has not been and his volunteers in the program have not been working on and the land that he, they have been working on, it's just, wow, this is great. And I have to then throw a few dollars in his way at his, yeah, because it, it's worth doing. Uh, believe me, if, if, if uh, you're concerned about climate, uh, if you're concerned about biodiversity, uh, about sustainable development, it just, just throw a few dollars uh, that you can afford toward the uh, Awahi uh, uh, forestry uh, a reforestation uh, uh, project, please. So with that, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Arthur Maderos. Thank you very much, Murph. Um, let's see if I can share a screen. Forgive my little awkwardness at the beginning here. I wanted to say a little bit about the film just to make sure that people knew what it was. The full title of the film is Olokahunua, Earth Lives. Uh, it's the ending of an Olelo Nooyao, a Hawaiian expression that says, Uve Kalani, Olokahunua, the sky cries, the earth lives. Um, it's a short animation film, Gene said it, 19 minutes on deforestation, but the promise also that ecological restoration offers, and it's done by this amazing artist, Jelly Rose. Uh, we'll be releasing it in 2022. If you send us an email, we'll let you know some, as well as you know our volunteer trips. So that's one thing I would advise to do. I wanted to actually start off with a, with a Oli. It's a Mele Como, an entrance Oli. I'm not the best Oli in the world, but prayer, I always say that a prayer sets, it's a prayer asking for permission that things go well whether it be an airplane flight or um, a meeting or entering the forest. So. Ooh, alu, kini kini ka huo, hi eli huo mai oa, o o lono nui a kea. Hali, hali ia e ka he hulu makan, hi hi i po ia ka poli mahano kane ho, o honu mea. Ooh, ah, ah. Ooh, a mole, ooh, a mohala ela, o kapapane, o kamamo, o kanuku ivi, o kahi hi. Mai hiki lalo, ai hiki luni, e wai ho ni i hali mokula. Ooh, ai kea hileo no ya. I love that chant, it honor, it actually compares students to seeds of the Ohia tree and talking about scattering of the seeds. 
um, as well as naming entities of the forest, some of which are there and some of which are no longer there. Um, uh, I, tell you, I titled the talk Continuing the Human Voyage of Discovery uh, because I think it's, it, and it's, a, it, we're, we all kind of, I think we all know in this human voyage, maybe we didn't, we weren't prepared for it, but we're kind of at an elbow now. We're, we're kind of at a shift now. Um, I wanted to say maybe a little bit more about me. I'm probably different than your normal scientist in that I was born and raised in Hawaii. And I didn't know that anything had happened to Hawaii uh, until people started telling me, you know, the trees you've been hiking in all these times, not a one of them is from Hawaii. And that started me on a voyage of discovery of actually learning plants. And when you learn the names of things, there's a Chinese thing about an uh, expression about uh, the beginning of wisdom means calling things by their correct names. So when you do the categories form out and you start to realize, I say some are fat, some are skinny, but they have one thing in common, they're all in trouble. And when you're from Hawaii, it's when you're from a place, it's not so easy to take a step back. I started to work for a national park and I worked with the federal government for 30 years before I started to actually, I don't want to, I just felt, felt my time could be better off with smaller groups of more intensely motivated individuals. And it made me think of Margaret Mead's line about never believe that small groups of people can't accomplish anything. In fact, they're the only things that ever have. A little bit about Hawaii. Um, and I don't want to go too much in this, but you know, it's out in the middle of the Pacific, as you know. And I usually say that in a planet the size of Earth, there's only one place to put a Hawaii because you've got to put it away from everything else for, for what has happened here to, to have happened. And so it's 2,300 miles in all directions. All the other islands in the, south, in the Pacific are kind of clustered around the Southern Pacific. Hawaii is by itself. And the volcanism there produces these incredible mountains. So the combination of isolation and these really tall mountains that Pretty much if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know that one side is really super wet and the other side is very dry like a desert. And so, uh, but this is a lot about the volcanism there, which has been producing islands for millions of years. And these islands have been kind of marching off. So in the Hawaiian tradition, kawahini ai la'au, kawahini ai pohaku, kawahini ai honua, the woman that eats the plants, the woman that eats the stones, the woman that eats the earth. And I'd like to show this picture because it is the Hawaii. You know, when we live in Hawaii, you kind of look out and you look down the street, you don't really realize it's an island, you know, surrounded by about the biggest desert in the world, you know, the Pacific, you know. And so that had an effect, which is that the ancestors of native Hawaiian plants and animals, they, they, they only, it only happened 600 or 700 times in 10 million years, about once every 30,000 years. Now it's happening, you know, every few weeks, a new plant is coming in. And so kind of the isolation created this thing, which is just that few colonizers all of a sudden had ecological freedom and they blew up ecologically. So they made clusters of related species. Uh, the honey creepers are probably the most spectacular. Uh, I'm looking it up here. I have a hard time reading it over my little thing, but that they are found only in Hawaii, once 59 species of birds, now only 17 remain, 10 endangered, four vulnerable, and only three species that are safe. And looking at all, the, I mean, the thing about them is common ancestor. So without competition from other birds, they basically became every other bird from woodpeckers to, they came in as tiny little green birds with tiny little bills and turned into everything else. And then I'll just say personally, as knowing these birds and, and at the beginning of my career, just kind of almost like collecting observations of them. I, they're beautiful. They're living jewels of the forest. And, 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 just, and, and some of them so cute in a way. And I know cute's a funny word, but innocent because they, they grew up without fear of humans. So sometimes they almost follow you through the forest so close. And then, when they, and then they lose interest in you and they fly off. And then it's a side thing, but you know, this ex the exposing of Polynesians, colonizing Polynesian, the Hawaiian culture with these birds is a cultural explosion, you know, centered around feathers. You know, Polynesians love feathers, especially red, but in Hawaii, the, the, the love of feathers actually extended into the yellow. Um, the other thing that happened in Hawaii is what we call adaptive shift. It just means things change. I told my students, change job. So things come in as one thing, and then it turns out that there's this incredible freedom to do something else. So uh, 
they shift to something that they've kind of been held to do. So caterpillars become ambush predators. The strike is a, is a 12th of a second. And there are non are carnivorous ones, but these carnivorous ones are just are beautiful. And then birds that are, I think are contributions like the Hawaiian, two thirds of the, our birds are gone. And a crow is fighting for its, its, its survival. To, to Hawaiian, to the Hawaiian culture, it was um, sometimes a symbol of uh, dark magic, uh, always thought to be supernatural, sometimes kept as a pet. Uh, Captain Cook wanted to trade for one when he got here. And though they were, fed, they were trading him feather cloaks, they wouldn't give him an alala. Uh, and probably the other thing that we've learned about them lately is tool use, is that they very quickly pick up tools. And if you look on YouTube, it's filled with it, of birds, not only using tools, but modifying. I think the modification is the part that's a little bit like stripping the bark off of them, shortening them when it's not big enough, doing multiple things like unlocking a box to get a second tool that then opens the box that has a reward in it. I tell people they make most birds look imbecilic with their intelligence. And then birds that in the yellow, the yellow in those cloaks, we thought that they were just honey eaters from the Pacific. And it was only recently, like 2008, that people started to realize, hey, you know, through DNA, these things are not the same thing from the Pacific. These are actually related to things like cedar wax wings, if you know your mainland birds. These are probably related to something like a cedar waxwing that came from that came from the U.S. mainland or North America in, instead to Hawaii and started this endemic group of uh, this endemic family, the Mohoids. Uh, I, I I I patched I keyed it up with this Aldo Leopold quote, which I love. When we hear his call, we hear no mere bird. We hear the trumpet in the orchestra of evolution. He is the symbol of our untamable past of that incredible sweep of millennia. And then probably uh, with Hawaii, there's always, there tends to be a tragic side to beautiful stories. And that's the family went extinct in 1978, 40 years actually before we discovered it was an endemic family. Uh, they went extinct. Let me see if I can play this for you. This is actually the, it was the last time it was seen was 1978 and this was recorded. Almost as if you could invent a haunting bird call. I believe this is the last male. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to, like, we think that this is a mating call. It's a, an advertising call. So um, this was Maui, my, my home. Uh, before humans arrived. And so basically you're seeing the influence of rain on the Northern slopes that makes those forests green, rain forests. And then the other one, big bands of koa, koa and dry forest. This is when humans first arrived. In the next one, non-native vegetation is shown in red. So pretty much the whole island is now covered by non-native species. Many, even native Hawaiians is tragic, but have never seen a native species. They have never seen anything like that. Uh, my, I have a little thing over mine, but my kumu, uh, my teacher, Wayne Gagne, was the one who called it Hawaii's tragic dismemberment. And this is the island of Molokai, but a very, this pattern is the same. It's mostly that I tell people, people say save the rainforest, but the fragments of rainforest is sometimes all that's left. And the Lanai Island. Um, in case you've never seen what erosion like this looks like, this is, this is it. And every time it rains heavily, the ocean turns red and bleeding. The land bleeds onto the reef, kind of a double tragedy. And then this quote from Robert Hosmer, prior to about 25 years ago, there was a belt of heavy forest with dense undergrowth in the Kula district between 35 and 5,000 feet immediately above the corn belt. Gradually, this forest was opened up by grazing until it's practically disappeared, save that its ex former extent can still be traced. Uh, when the Smithsonian did a, a report on extinctions in Hawaii, they called the Kula area the epicenter of extinction in the Hawaiian Islands. And because the Hawaiian Islands are probably epicenter of extinction in the Pacific, the Kula on Maui is probably the epicenter of extinction in the, in the Pacific meaning that more species have disappeared completely from that area.
my the force I'm going to be talking a little bit about is one of those kind of tr was a tragic poster child. It was a place that uh, well, it first kind of became famous because of the explorations of Joseph Rock, a, a photographer, and he published a book. And he actually, his guide was William Kaioka Malie. Uh, and it turns out that they actually became really good friends. And they, you know, when Joseph Rock came, he would stay. And Joseph Rock was very interested in the Hawaiian language. And actually, this interaction turned out to be critical because Joseph Rock passed on to this Hawaiian man how important the forest was. Uh, this was um, many years before I was born, but that knowledge would stay in that family. And so many years later, when I asked the ranch owner, why did you even listen to me? He said, you know, because the Hawaiian cowboys, Bill Malie, uh, they always told me how valuable the forest was. Um, so, um, and so William Kiyoko Malie, uh, it actually means the fish of the calm ocean, uh, referring to sweet potato. But you can keep the name because later, I'll, I'll kind of, I work with his descendants now. And so I'm honored to work with his descendants, like one, two, three, four, five generations of Hawaiian botanists. The dry forests are particularly important to Hawaiians, Native Hawaiians. And my kumu is Isabella Abbott. She's a famous ethnobotanist. And she was the one who said they're vahipana they're celebrated or treasured places and that the refrigerators, the ocean was the refrigerator and the dry forest was the toolbox. It's basically a list of all the things, but you know, it's, it's, it's the whatever, it's the hardware store of the Hawaiians. It's where you go to get something, except that this hardware store is a forest and, and, and the knowledge goes deep into the forest about what to use for what. Um, this is actually, we put together a little montage because Oahe right now has almost no native birds. Okay, but this is a montage of from fossil records, the birds that were there. And I think I think I can play this tape. One of, one of our people in our staff put all the little calls of the birds that we could get together to see what, what he is silent nowadays. It's silent except for like twitterings of little Japanese white eye, but formerly it was a cacophony. When Joseph Rock, he worked in Hawaii in the 1920s, and then he left to work in China. He actually started to publish National Geographic and had some famous, very famous pictures of China. He came back to Hawaii in 1950s. And when he saw the shape of Oahe Forest, it said that he fell to his knees. Um, that's, this is close to the forest that he saw. And I think he must have been amazed at the openings in the forest, but by the time I saw the forest 40 years later, it was really falling apart. It was in uh, free fall. Um, the terrible thing about this is that these are not the same tree. This is, uh, in fact, the, we call this a museum forest when we first got to it, because all the trees are different species. So we made the analogy it was like a museum. Everything was there. And like a museum, nothing was alive. It was, I wrote in a paper, one windstorm away from being a pastor, um, so that's the situation I came to. And people told me, walk away, Art. I mean, you know, take, in fact, I got told, take pictures while they're still there. Uh, part, a lot of the trouble with this African grass, Kikuyu, that was invasive and everywhere forming these very thick mats. And this is Halapepe, a sacred tree. And this is the African grass growing right up it. So kind of, this is the scene that we're left with. This is actually a really nice, a really nice section of it. Um, I wanted to say that it's not all lost. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll bring out a few highlights of it. Ohia lehua, um, it's actually the plant that dominates the northern windward forest, but when it comes over to the leeward side, it just becomes one of many, one of 40 tree species. Um, it is, it's been documented as the oldest uh, flowering plant in the northern hemisphere, like up to 500 years old. 
tremendous, uh, the species tells a lot of the story, polymorphism. It, 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 it dominates uh, forests and goes from one end of the archipelago to the other one, but it has so many different forms as a shape shifter. Um, so it, flower color is one way it's really moving around and these are young uh, kids kind of discovering it's important as honey for honey creepers at the food source. They're all they're doing taste tests on different flower colors and yes the flower colors do taste differently we discovered. I was amazed. And then plants like the halapepe which are kinolao body forms of the goddess Kopo, um, but also are just an incredibly endemic, important endemic species. The other thing about this, this one here is that this one makes, has big corollas. These are about maybe three inches long each and filled with nectar for birds that aren't there anymore, actually. So you can get under a tree like this and actually shake it and get a little nectar rain down on you. Uh, it's, it's, I, in one sense, it's tragic, but you know there, you know there is maybe hope that 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 honey creepers will one day return. You never know what the potential we have, and things like the sandalwood, the Haleakala sandalwood, lesser known trees like Aiea, and the Hole. Hole in the Hawaiian dictionary means this tree, Okrosia Haleakala. It means a kapa, a bark cloth that's dyed with this tree, a beautiful orange yellow, uh, a little bit like the fruit, but a richer orange. Uh, and it also means the verb of to do that. I worked with some, uh, uh, a restoration project in Tahiti, and uh, we worked with Okrosha Tahitiensis. And the name there, is, the regional name there is Ole, Marquesan name. I was shocked. The idea that Polynesians would know the name of this rare tree from both. I mean, of course they would know it, but to somehow transmit that knowledge across the archipelago, two archipelagos, uh, I just phenomenal achievement culturally, I just believe. So then with their fruits. You, uh, throughout the Pacific, it's used for its yellow wood to make kind of a light, strong things. I wanted to do something. I, I tell people, I don't know how long you can walk through destroyed forests before you start to scheme of things that you can do. And the land owner was a, was a rancher. And at first they, they you know, what are you, they, what, what are you gonna do on the land? I'm gonna go look around. Now, what do you wanna do? I wanna put up some fences and try something. To do what? To try to save the trees that are out there. Okay. I came up with a different strategy. Instead of working on the trees themselves, I worked on these things. These are shrubs, the common shrubs. So I basically, I built the house back around the trees. Um, I say this, this is, this is probably the big, there are, you know, when you, I, I was doing things that nobody, that my teachers had never done before, you know? And so you're gonna make discoveries, you know, you're gonna make ecological discoveries, but probably the most, and so there's a lot of ecological discoveries I made, you know, but. I think the people were the most important thing that I found personally, because as a biologist over the decades, I just come to the conclusion that people don't care. Nobody cares enough to do anything. Come on, you guys, it's only us guys that care. And, and I was wrong because all those years, you know, I started, I, I really, I got myself in trouble by taking on too big a project and I asked for help and people started to come. They came from the very first time and they've never stopped coming. And so I think what I, from the beginning in 99, we became aware that the ecological restoration can involve the community in a way that can foster a heightened sense of awareness of the environment. All of a sudden, after working all day, they were really interested in things, not only in the environment, in the culture. And so there was communication back and forth, actually. People were, it's one thing to hear something, it's another thing to care so deeply about it that you remember it for the rest of your life. So that's what I witnessed, you know. And you know, there were brave days. The first people came out, we only did it with no evidence. We did it because we had no place to go. There was no backing up. Backing up meant just going home and accepting it. Um, I show this picture because the OO became a part of us, the metal tool. And it's actually talked about by, by some of the Hawaiian uh, scholars, Kamakao, as something that united the community. 
that because you have people who make the holes and people that plant and people that, that the community is united by this. And they talk about how in the old days, how people used to do them in rhythm. We don't do them in rhythm, but how in the old days, 40 or 50 people would use an oh in rhythm, falling up and down. And I have to say it has the same effect of the, and the noise of it, the think, think, think. As we, and it's very surgical. So our, our planting holes are very um, small. They don't cause a lot of ground disturbance. Kind of jumping ahead and stealing my own thunder, but this is 20 years ahead when you jump ahead of time. And that area that was bearing ground that those people were is probably in the lower part of this upper exposure here. Um, humbling, actually, almost spiritual to see the trees come back. Um, and to see them kind of develop among themselves a type of resistance. There's so many weeds in this area. When we did this, we just expected that the whole place would turn off into turn up in the weeds, and we still do a lot of weed control. But the forest is self-organizing, and and the, and 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 well, these are the data like this you could only dream of. It's basically that you know the native species went up, every, the bad things went down, and leaf litter went up. That's another thing that I like to think of. So these these lines are are almost magical. And that there's native species on one side and there's an African grass on the other side and stumps of old things. We got, so we did that, you can see two here. We started off our first one, we did our second one, and then we did our third one. So now we have three of them, three areas. And um, the musician Paul Simon just did, a, just did a concert on Maui and he, he provided a donation that will do a, the fourth area, which is actually between, if you look the two at the bottom, there's a little patch of trees maybe between these two areas, uh, but that's the area right there. Uh, really a great area. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually really stoked about that. And then from Google. This is kind of the cool thing for me to see is the leaf litter, the self-organization, the kind of the way that the plants almost make skirts around themselves of leaf litter and this starts nutrient cycling and also protects it from weeds and creates, you know, Harper called it safe places, safe places for Hawaiian seedlings. And so with trees being protected kind of like malu is the Hawaiian word to protect, you know, so they, and maybe that would have been the end of it. Um, I guess the miracle was that seedlings started to come. And so species that hadn't reproduced in hundreds of years, I mean, literally hundreds of years, the only tree there is are hundreds of years old, these old geriatric trees started to pop seedlings. Sometimes a lot. This is Olopua and I mean, this is staggering actually for a native Hawaiian botanist. It's like, no, that can't be Olopua. Olopua doesn't make seedlings and that's partially because it just doesn't have protected places. Ala'a, <clears throat> which is a, it's known for its resonant wood is from making um, kappa, kappa anvils, and as well as tools. And it, throughout the Pacific, it's, it's like in Samoa, the related species are used for lalo drums. I think it's a very resonant wood, probably would be a great wood for ukuleles or guitars, and things like the papala, the fireworks tree, which uh, fireworks tree, it's an unusual family. So it, it, it can, it lights up like, uh, it's a balsa wood that lights like paper or like almost like a fireworks thing and it's tossed off of cliffs and makes a kind of a pyrotechnic display. Um, these are the species uh, that started to, two thirds of the trees in the area started to now have babies. And so this is the list of things that started to have babies in the rest, in the restored forest area. The ones in yellow are the ones that I've never seen outside the area. Some, in some cases like in, um, uh, uh, Chryso Dracon, there's more, there's more babies in the 10 acre explosure than there is in the rest of Maui County, which is three other islands, Maui, Maui, Lanai, and, and Molokai. There's more natural babies, natural babies in the 10 acres. So for me, I don't know which I like better, is to see the forest coming back or to see the people interested. I mean, the forest coming back is of course essential, but without the people being interested, um, I, I probably will say my line from one of my kumus, Jeff Park, who said, at this point in the degradation of nature, the last fragments are, unimpa are, are unimportant compared to the hearts and minds of people. 
and it gives me no pleasure to report this to you, but without the hearts and minds of people, the last fragments don't stand a chance. And so when I see people start to care about the forest, sometimes I tell people I feel like a matchmaker almost, I, and I don't have to do much. I just have to kind of like put people in juxtaposition and something happens, magical. Uh, a little bit of a side note here is we, uh, with colleagues from USGS, we investigated this question because, you know, when we took Hawaiian kids out there, I would tell them, put, we'd be sitting out where this lower picture is out in the grass before we went inside the forest area. And I'd say, put your hand under the, under the grass. What does it feel like? Oh, hot and dry. And then we would go inside and I would say, put your hand under the leaf litter. What does it feel like? Oh, wet and cold like a refrigerator, Kumu. And we would, I would put my hand, yeah, it is cold and it is wet. And so we investigated that. And I think colleagues, hydrologist colleagues were like, there's not gonna be any differences because these are only a couple of decades old. And I mean, there were. And so I think that's, I think that's what, that actually says neat things for the whole world, to be honest, because we have these areas that were identical. We reforced one of them and guess what? The hydrology, so just like cells, it starts to self start itself or at least improve itself, head toward that direction. In natural forests, uh, many plants produce seeds and these seeds, uh, only a fraction of them grow. So part of the formula in ecological restoration is to get in it, it involves people. And so people have something to do. They go out into the forest, they collect seeds. And with these seeds, and even things, rare things, this is from the last tree of this, of this slope, the last hoaba. And from one comes many. I mean, and I, it's not a good genetic basis, to be honest, but as trees recombine in the future, they bring up hidden genetic uh, potential. So I'm, I'm not one to give up at this point. And then working with people that are practiced, we can, this is something that we easily can do. And then it's to taking them up to the forest. And then for me, the sacred connection of kind of connecting them with those people that put their time aside. I have a little expression I use. They say that people came to the mountain to help the mountain, but nobody ever helped the mountain as much as the mountain helped them. Um, maybe a little synopsis of our program. A 24 year collaboration with a ranch. I mean, the idea that I would be working with a ranch and proud of it, proud of the, my relationship with the cowboys and their pride in it. Um, so that's a beautiful thing and that we do volunteer trips, 225 so far, planted nearly 130,000 seedlings, uh, over 6,000 native seedlings of endangered plant species. Let's delist a few of them maybe. And that we've gathered everything from within a mile of the exposure. We're not trying to make hard to get through botanical gardens or, or Disneylands. We're trying to get a place, a sanctuaries in a, in, in, a, in a world that doesn't, these species don't have any other place to go. This is the only place they have. Uh, so what does the Wahi have to do with the rest of the world? I mean, it's a valid question. Maybe nothing, but we, what we discovered was our community was in trouble. And I didn't even, I didn't think people would reach, I didn't think people would be as responsive as they were. I thought people care too much about the beach and that kind of stuff to really care. And I was wrong. Um, that's, and so I've often said, if you have a problem in your local community, and you have a meeting, like, kind of like what we did, you might be surprised who shows up. If it's just that good hearted meeting about let's do something, kind of guys. Uh, and that's another thing I, ha I would have to say is the fusion between people. You see people who these guys don't know, didn't know each other at the beginning of the day, but there's an esprit of, esprit de corps is the French word, right? The spirit of the group, right? That happens after you're doing something and you know that other person is doing the same, same he's there for the same reasons you are. And you're both kind of making a defense of something. And the young man on the left is uh, is Hawaiian, so it's his culture. And that's so that's the other thing is just to see the Hawaiian culture bloom in this role as protectors. You know, I think you know we all want to be do something important. I've told people one surprise for me is that so many people have heroes in them, authentic heroes. You know? um, so sometimes it's just arranging the right thing for somebody to do. It's just arranging that good deed and then it's almost, it catches fire by itself. It sounds corny, but 
I've seen it actually so many times. And I've seen the way people are moved by it, especially when you give them a little bit of information. Um, and then there's the talk stories. I mean, I, I, I think now, I, I just think talk story, uh, talk story, a little local expression for having lunch and then everybody chatting. I don't think lunch ever tasted so good or people laughing across groups. I don't really, you know, and this is obviously pre COVID, but we're, you know, we, I think we all, we all our, our core wants and in some ways needs to, wants to move back to this stage. And then it's not just people, it's this idea of cultural connections with the plants that some of that that you planted, maybe you come back and you say, wow, look at this. Or maybe you say, this is the IAEA. You know, my professor said that the IA was a it was the equivalent of a tomato becoming a tree. It was so botanically weird, uh, but people develop connections, either cultural connections or just understanding it. And the more knowledge you have, I think I always tell people, knowledge makes things important. Without knowledge, I don't think anything is important. Um, and so this is a super rare plant. I rediscovered it, and so, but in a way, who cares? right? If nobody else becomes connected to it until you give it to somebody, this is a seedling of that. I tell them this has just been recently rediscovered and there's only like probably 30 wild individuals and you give it to them. You can just see it in them. Metamorphosis. <clears throat> um, I put this, I teamed up this am amazing picture, but, um, and not from Hawaii, but I teamed it up with the Aldo Leopold quote that I like, our tools are better than we are. They grow faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom, to command tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history, to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. And maybe it's because that's Hawaii, but we're, that's kind of what we've discovered. And we all, and two, we know that places like this, once again, not Hawaii, tropical, but we know that around the world, it doesn't matter. All wild places are troubled and we're kind of at the end of wild ecosystems. And this is actually becoming more the norm than the exception. I, I, I used to tell people that I started off my career looking, you know, exploring the patches of weeds in the forest. And now sometimes I feel like I'm exploring the patches of forest and the weeds. I know it's tragic and I don't mean it just to be a simple uh, glib statement. It's, but it does, it does put your back against the wall a little bit. Um, we've changed the atmosphere. I'm not going to go into it, but we've, we're changing the atmosphere. And we were obviously taking the planet to places that's never been before. What a species we are. I mean, just in a way, masters of many things and not of other things. And in changing places, I think we're changing ourselves too. But we're at this turn, and I think I want to get to this next slide because we're at this turn right now where we realize, wow, we have to do something. I mean, um, Glasgow is an example of people saying we have to do, but you know, I'm a little disappointed that we can't muster more of a cry. We're clearly in this transition to doing something more. Um, I put this little analogy, turning the canoe. It's actually, there was a movie that we made that was named after this, but it came from my analogy of when I used to paddle canoe. If you're in a canoe in rough water and you're trying to turn the boat and nobody really knows what to do, it's very difficult to turn the boat. Um, the boat has no glide, no momentum. And so the boat is just stubborn. It's like a pig, it just sits there, you know? And you have to have somebody who knows what to do, who tells one, two, and three to paddle one way and four and five to paddle the other way and tells everybody what to do and when to turn it. And so turning the canoe is one of the hardest things to do. And especially when you're caught without momentum, without glide, when you're dead in the water, it, it takes a lot. And I make the analogy that the last generation, it wasn't their fault, but they didn't know what was coming. And so everybody jumped out of the canoe and were pointed in the wrong direction. And so that's what I see Glasgow being about is the kind of the chaos that comes with turning the canoe, especially in rough water where it's easy to be distracted. I put these two words up, discover and explore, and from their root words, which I like, the opposite of to cover up or explore from the hunter's term, to set out a large cry or to weep. And I saw a lot of this, especially when I heard Glasgow, and I realized a lot of this isn't gonna be so simple. I mean, I think we all realize this is either, 
it's a generational changes and that's what it's going to take probably it's, we're at the beginning of it and we can push as hard as we can but certain uh, maybe a gener every generation can only change so much um uh, i'm near the end of my talk you guys so mercifully i'm i'm close to finishing this is uh kalaao kiyokumalie she's sixth generation from that black from the man in the black and white picture uh that's her great great grandfather um this is her at the beginning of our program i'm not even sure how many years ago it was when she was a child but she's grown up in the forest with us um that's her father uh, i know a uh, you want to talk about good-hearted sincere people and passing it on to his daughter so between son and daughter straight as an arrow um and the kind of kumuing uh guiding that you know is going to be permanent uh, i i will have to say that i never had experiences like with my father like this um and i'm i i for people who have seen my talk before they've seen the same quote so i apologize but i like to use it because of how i to me how powerful it is and how much it represents kalaao kalaao means the plant uh, so kalaao kiokumulie malia pahai kiuno pakapaku nui a olika Perhaps it's a small stone that can keep the big rock from falling down. So I do think that it's people like uh, Kalaao that will make the generational change. Because just like me, she doesn't have any other place to go. She has to. And then this is almost a personal reminder. It's from one of my heroes, Jeff Park, that when we deal with this, we're not just dealing with mountain lands in a way that we have to restore, especially if culture is going to be, uh, you know, culture and nature are connected at the hip. And so we, it's every piece of land that we need. It's little, I tell people little, little rivers that go through towns are often unkept and can be re, redone. We're, we're at a, a time where they're not making any more land, they're making more people and, and culture and nature are against the ropes. And so I just like, to, I try to tell people, think out of the box, think creatively. Um, our collaborators, uh, we're lucky we have so many of them. Probably the primary one, though, Ulupalakua Ranch. They give up their ranch lands. They don't get anything. They they give up their best lands. Uh, they ask permission, actually, to come into some of our areas, not into the forest areas, but around them. They, the cows actually serve a vital role in eating the weeds around them until we get there. So we have this incredible relationship with a ranch. Um, and then straight in the middle, project partners, they also provide funding for the ranch too. We're a small group. We barely, I mean, we just keep our staff going, but every one of our staff is devoted. Um, Mahalo Loa means long thanks. Uh, these are the people that I know that helped. The International Institute for the Indigenous Resource Management, uh, Jessa Phillips and Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the Kumulao Foundation, Neolii Foundation and Jean Rubin and Marv Tano, they, they're the ones who put this together. Uh, I probably missed people and you, uh, I'm asking for your forgiveness. And uh, this is one of the pictures from a drone and my email and our website. Um, um, thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you, Art. Really appreciate that uh, <clears throat> the briefing and uh, also the inspiration. Uh, we have we have some questions uh, over here. Uh, someone uh, has asked: Will the restored forest parcels uh, expand on their own beyond the original plantings? No, because the forces. That had that made them in danger are still not corrected, and that's you know it, we're in a cattle ranch, so the cattle have to be gotten rid of. But even if there were, even if the cattle were gotten rid of, there's animals in the area, and at this point, I almost say it's almost like CPR. The patient is lying on the ground, so it needs a multiple stage process. So I would I would say that I don't want to make it seem like this was easy. To be honest, I think it's the the ground was the, the I think the good thing about restoration is once you claim it. Once you get it, it's kind of it's self-organizing and it takes less trouble. But especially the front parts of it are um, take take energy, take a lot of attention, take people that really care. 
You know, I, I started off uh, by saying, Art, that, uh, that the uh, uh, forest is more than trees. And one of the things that uh, uh, we stress when we do workshops or around agriculture and, and uh, environmental restoration is that, uh, you know, we, we tend to see the big stuff. We see the tree, uh, we see the shrub, we see the flower. But all of that small stuff that's, you know, just under the litter, that's under, uh, you know, uh, six inches, 12 inches below the litter, below the duff, the stuff that's in the, in the canopy, all of that counts. Uh, that's all part of that family, that system that you're talking about. Can you describe a bit about how those systems in Hawaii work? Well, I'll probably describe, I think they work similar to other places, but I would probably describe, I will, I'm going to change the question a little bit, sorry, Merv, and I'm going to say how they recover, because that's the interesting part for me. Oh, yeah. Is that sometimes they have these old trees, like those old trees that you saw in there. I don't think we realized how critically important they were, and especially until I, when I also, the Australians were one, I traveled in Australia, and they were, they really say, these old trees are um, reservoirs of microorganisms and invertebrates that are on this tree and when you release them, you know, and that's what as I've now started to see things like, I mean, spiders probably don't seem very much to much people, but these are Hawaiian spiders that have bloomed into the area and are now comfortable in our area. Spiders are bird food. <laughs> so spiders fuel bird populations. So to see things like spiders or in a very simple relationship with first spiders and prey, right? But it's the, it's the heartbeat of the ancient system, you know, and when when you see birds, you're seeing them as the top of the ecosystem, you know, the final product. But you had to have all those things like lots of spiders, and to get lots of spiders, lots of little herbivores, and to get lots of little herbivores, lots of fresh buds. Oh, those little fresh buds make all those little bugs eat, ferns all the little herbivores, ferns all the little so. And then what do the birds do? They're pollinating and spreading seeds. So people say systems, and I think it's easy to make some kind of glib thing about you know that everything is perfect but they are i mean they they operate they operate they for me what's beautiful is to see them reorganize and self-organize because especially after people told me forget it art it's too late and now to actually know that they were wrong and i mean and to actually they were wrong about not hoping in a way which is you know i mean uh, and it makes me say well what else can we do that we, that we don't know what we that we don't know whether it's possible or not you know because when this when we understood this was possible other people tried this technique in hawaii and guess what it worked in other places sometimes not as well or with different species but it works so it's kind of like now the light is on is that oh my god we can we can, we can maybe maybe work back instead of like making a planting and you know people in the old days would plant the rare trees and so I remember planting rare trees in small fences and then coming back and sometimes the rare tree would die. And so you would have an empty fence in the middle of nowhere. And it broke my heart as somebody from Hawaii, you know, I was like, and that's when I got to the point of saying, I don't want to fence any more one trees. I'm done. If it's not a system, then I don't want to protect it because systems are going to be around after I'm gone. Yeah. My hair is turning a little gray here. I won't be around forever. And so the best way to do that is to teach people. Actually, I, I tell people, it's almost like, I tell people it's almost like dating. You just see what I see. Just allow me to show you what I see. And I trust you. I trust you have the same reaction that I have. And that's, I, to be honest, that's probably where I've been most gratified with people. Because when you when you take that plunge and you ask people to see what it, and to, that you trust them, you don't know what their reaction is gonna be. I have a perfect record. I mean, not everybody, but, you know, I had a boss that used to say, Art, you want everybody in the world to like you, but they're not all going to like you. And you know why? They're not listening. Only 40% of the people in the world are listening. You're listening really hard. And if you, tr if you work with that 40%, you can, you can face any issue. He was a major politician in Hawaii. And I've really taken that as the, the 30 to 40% of the people in the world that really care about these issues. We can form an army. And, and, and it's, it's, it, it's, 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 it'll be, it'll be enough. Someone asked a question about the tourist economy, um, asking if it's a dead end for uh, preserving Hawaii. 
I'd like to kind of couch it in, can there be a tourist industry uh, that is compatible with the kinds of uh, uh, work that you're doing for restoration? Can it be compatible to, in a sense, restoring the, uh, the environment of, uh, of the islands? Yep. I think you hit something that there's a, there's a potential there. So do we see it today? No, I mean, not in my opinion. But the Hawaii Tourism Authority, I think they see the gap. That's a possibility. Is it possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do think that there's really, and I think there's a really amazing thing that could happen between visitors and local people. If visitors saw local people, if local people saw visitors caring about our land, it'd be transformational, to be honest, because sometimes we just see them as coming in, having a Mai Tai, blasting around the island at high speed, and then taking off, you know? Um, so I think it would be transformational and I, and I, and having met, I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't think every, maybe it is 30% or 40%. I don't think most, I don't think all tourists care. I think some of them have packaged up Hawaii as they would almost any place that's warm. Uh, but I do think that some of them care. And I do think it's exploiting those people that care that there's a lot of progress that can be made. So, you know, I would be honored to work with people and, and to be honest, to see tourists working with local people i mean it's i think there would be a lot of healing to be honest after covid you know a lot of people looked at hawaii as a place just to visit really quickly and so hawaii got swamped with people you know um, local people were overwhelmed a little bit i think um, yeah people and not and almost an irreverence for cultural importance or biological importance or and so i think there's a but is there potential Absolutely. I, I, you know, and that's another thing is that sometimes I'm at the ranch and I end up talking to some tourist and I'm always amazed that when they hear the real story, they're so interested. They're so interested in the real details. And so that makes me hopeful, right? Because that's potential. Because if you talk and they're not interested, that's, that's just not, a, it's, it's, there's hope, there's potential there. And so your question was, can it work? Absolutely. It could be something great. Is it going to work with every person in every situation? Negative. But there are 30% of the people that come to Hawaii that are highly moral people that are actually looking for more and don't, not seeing it. And if they had a chance to hang out with Ainoa for the day, oh my God, yeah. a privilege, actually, to be honest. Right. With you. A privilege. You, you, I said something you'll never forget. You'll never forget that experience. I guarantee yeah. you. Everything else in that trip, you won't forget that. Yeah, you know, the, this notion of uh, ecotourism uh, uh, is, uh, I, I, I think, in, in very many respects, uh, uh, is uh, kind of overstated. But I really believe that there is a, there is a space for that, to, to, because it's not just about green. But as you say, it's about the human element. It's about those kinds of relationships. What I said about information making things important, telling about the Lama, you know, telling them that this is sacred to Hawaiians, that these leaves are sacred, you know, and that this is what they sash the heiau with, you know, and or that this is our most, or that this one is, I just think that that makes the people look at the trees differently there. All of a sudden, I just see them looking around like, well, like friends more. And anyhow, that familiarity, I think, is going to be, that's that's key, making a community of experts and and may, and helping them pass it on to people that are interested. Uh, what's our time like, Jean? Uh, Mitch, we have, we have a, a little more time, right, for questions and discussion? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay, you showed a picture of a subdivision, huh? right? And you said, you know, it's not just the, the ranch, the open spaces, but it's every place. Because uh -huh. I have a little project that I'm working on, on my little kuleana over here. But I, I would like to get your uh, ideas on how you uh, can rewild these subdivisions, if you will. Well, I think it's more, comp I mean, that's a really good question. And I wish I had a better answer than I'll have, but I'll take a stab at it. Uh, 
the one thing I see, first of all, is people just growing plants makes them familiar with it. So that's the lowest level is that they're becoming familiar with plants. Whenever I would learn, try to learn a plant, I would always grow it, know it in all its stages, try to just see it. So I think there's a familiarity aspect. Beyond that, the, to, to value the projects like ours, I mean, I mean, this is something very specific, but our wild trees are up there in the mountains. Sometimes there's only one or two of them. And it's some landowner that could say, I can take care of plant X. I can take care of papala. And so I will grow, I will grow papala now, help be a living seed source, because I think that seed farms can be an important part of not robbing nature from its, of its seeds and allowing natural seeds to have their own place. Um, so I would say seed sources. And then um, the idea that, I mean, I don't know, it might seem far fetched to some people, but it, it, you know, it's when, it's when I worked out with some landowners is this idea of planting host plants for certain lepidopterans that are highly endangered that don't have food plants or larval plants. So if you have pl everybody plants their, their little home with larval and food plants, the moths will find them, they're trap liners, they'll figure it out and they'll probably remember it. Uh, so we're developing neighborhoods. Uh, those are my, those are probably my simple ways, but I also say that just familiarity is, is part of it, to be honest. And, and also cultural plants have nothing, to, like a lot of times I see people, Olona in Hawaii, everybody wants to see, everybody wants to look for Olona. And when they find a wild population, they often, it's the world's strongest natural fiber, it has really long latissifers, like sometimes many meters long. And so it's like nylon basically. You know, but culturally it's so important, right? So everybody wants it. So there's a tendency when you see it to grab it. And so sometimes I think that growing cultural things, making farms of cultural things, not only protects wild places and wild populations, but it, it does what we want to do. It jumpstarts cultural traditions. Why, isn't, why don't we see more all enough footage? And so I look at it, the cultural part as being important too. For, okay. That's some. There's a question about the, for you, uh, have you done more, some of the sort of reforestation work on, uh, uh, on other islands? Uh, uh, but I would add to that, are there other kinds of reforestation efforts uh, taking place uh, in, in the islands? I think there's a lot of them now. I w we were the first project. When we, when we started this project, I don't think there was a word. I mean, if there was a word ecological restoration, very few people used it. We just started from the grassroots level of protecting our forests and we knew that they wouldn't come back by themselves. And so trying to do a more multiple step, almost like CPR on the, on the patient, a multiple stage CPR to bring them back. Um, I think that the Oahe project helped give hope to that. That and I would say Hakalao project on, on the big island was working with coral forests and we were the two beginning projects that actually had a little bit of success. So are there other projects now? Tremendously. And I think uh, what are the, I think there's some really good work being done on the big island with dry forest. And, um, but to be honest, <laughs> considering the number of natural areas that are fading, there are, there are some really good projects, but there are more natural areas that are fading without protectors. Um, you know, um, I, you know, when I, the, the Hawaiian island is divided up by a, by a pre-existing form of Hawaiian land divisions, Ahupua'a, but then the larger one are Moku, Moku, and Moku are larger divisions, like Maui has 12 of them, you know, it has like 100 and something Ahupua'a, but 12 Moku, larger land divisions, Honua'ula, um, Kahului, Makawao, uh, Hamakuapoko, Hamakualoa, Hana. And so originally I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if every Moku who had their own project and would invite it's something actually I saw in Australia where people invited people from from different places it's almost like the Oahi thing you know you invite somebody who's not from there to come to your lands and help you and then when they come you thank them and it creates a type of a community bonding actually I think and so the Moku thing was that everybody had their project and we exchanged and in the Australian example that I saw you know we helped the project and they fed us lunch you know, they had us lunch in the main hall. And I do think that that's, I, I love the, I love the idea of that. You know, of, I don't know, I, maybe I'm just that kind of old fashioned guy that really wants to see people acting with people again, because it's just, it was magical because you would think that, oh yeah, you know, today I, sometimes I get skeptical about people, but under those situations, hard to be skeptical. 
because people start acting in ways that you can see the genuine nature of humanity coming out. If you ask me, our, our, at least our potential, our potential is to really care for each other, to have great empathy for each other, you know. And I, but that only, obviously, that only comes with that kind of contact. There's a, there's a question, Art. Uh, where do you uh, find uh, endemic seeds on Maui? Uh, that's probably uh, there are two really good nurseries on Maui. Um, Ho'olawa, uh, Ho'olawa Farms, H O O L A W A, and Native Nurseries run by Anna Palomino and Jonathan Kaiser. Uh, Maui has some of the best, the best people. On, uh, we, we happen to, I think there's three great nurseries in Hawaii that I know of, uh, native nurseries. Two of them are on Maui. So Anna Palomino, Ho'olawa Farms, or um, native nurseries, Jonathan Kaiser, are superior. We're, we're gifted to have them. And they work with the Hawaii program for decades now. They know what they're doing. Okay, this one is kind of off the wall, Art. But, you know, you mentioned Ahupua'a. Okay, uh, you know, as, as a land division, and then, because uh, one of the things that uh, has, has uh, kind of occurred to me uh, is that, uh, you know, how does a person become a konohiki in the 21st century? Can you kind of explain what a konohiki is? And, uh, you know, the point, uh, in a sense of getting your your marching orders from a a, a, a lee, uh, you know, basically it calls for a different uh, uh, set of skill sets, if you will. So, can can you talk a little bit about that? Boy, that's a hard one, though. I mean, it's that's one thing that my dad used to say: easy for say, hard for do. And that's just <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's just a hard one because, especially Konohiki from the sometimes uh, Konohiki is a kind of a I would describe it as a steward, uh, and so and but in a in mostly in a in a cultural or a land sense, you're the steward of the land. If something goes on, you're kind of the sheriff in a little bit of way, but just more of a gentle sheriff. Um, you're certainly the one who knows the land. Um, I think we are in a difficult time, and I. Uh, because we have cultural roles and we have science roles and a lot of times they're not shared. Uh, the people that are the scientists are, are not cultural people and the cultural people disregard science as being part of the valid approach. And I'm one that probably believes that we need to, that cultural people need to be masters of culture and masters of science. And, and that with this combination, they have a, a common, they have a, a skill set combination that will outperform, I don't want to say outperform, but it, that they're superior now because they have all the science. So I would actually probably say that cultural people need to get all the science gifts so that that they become, I've seen it actually in New Zealand where uh, in one of the rivers there, the Maori said, you know what, because this is so controversial with land, why don't we, our people we will be in charge of monitoring water quality. And so now it's them that will say that report how the river is going. They become the authority, right, that says this. I would like to see that happen. So for me, Konohiki means developing systems that share cultural knowledge and scientific knowledge and makes especially indigenous people, but all people capable of accepting new roles as we move forward. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Um. Oh, so, so so someone's asked um, if it's possible to rewatch the presentation. So all uh, most of the presentations are recorded. This one was uh, recorded and posted on the the museum's uh, YouTube channel. We are um, starting to enhance our institute YouTube channel, so we'll be posting these as well. Uh, with one caveat, um, for all sorts of um, intellectual property concerns. We, we will not be um, posting the trailer. Uh, however, we have our eye on when the thir when the 19 minute final film comes out and we would love to have um, a presentation that includes the full length film. So that's my first invitation to art. 
up to. Just let, you just let, let us know when the time is right. And I will say that the three minute video is on our uh, Oahe uh, YouTube channel. We have a new YouTube channel. Oh. Videos on it. But okay. okay. Great. So when uh, when the museum and when we post this recording, I think there's a way that we can uh, share that link as well. Awesome. Thank you. And Jilly, I just communicated with Jilly, and she said that uh, she's aiming for her part of it being done in February. And so I think we're you know we're we're headed we're headed to the barn. It's been a long it's been a long process, and it's a beautiful one. Working with Jilly has been amazing. She's what was great about Jilly was to see the way that she grasped the situation immediately. I don't want to talk about Jilly too much, but she's an Australian. We explained the situation. We drove her up there and I think she was shocked at the loss of forest. Mm -hmm. she, she had to make sure. What we're talking about is that there used to be trees here, right? From here to here, <laughs> and not here anymore, right? That's what we're saying. That's what you're saying. Right, so right. From over there to over there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Jilly, that's what I'm saying, sadly. My God, you know, like, what? It's a, it's a, she, what did she say? If this was Australia, it would be a national tragedy. I was like, you know, it is here too, except we kind of don't know it in a way. I mean, but Hawaiians would bleed to hear that the, that the Wawakua, the sacred places, have been um, torn apart a little bit. I mean to be a, I dude, we we are, we are the generation that has hope. I mean, I, we have we know wild places. We especially who have been around for a little while have hiked in wild places and and thought they would be there forever. I don't really know if anybody does that anymore, where they're hiking in wild places and they think this is going to be here into perpetuity, that nothing is going to change this. Right? You know, and so I think now everybody's in the same place in the world is. You know, there's a there's a Polynesian story about a man who's in a fight. Uh, on the seashore and being they're dri being driven into the ocean and he takes his spear and he puts it through his foot into the into the sand and he tells everybody friends and enemies i'm not taking another step back and everybody is shocked by it and it's the turn of the battle is that everybody fights their way out of the water and the people are so impressed and i do think that sometimes things begin with i'm, I'm maybe i, I just begin with somebody making a stand on something and asking for help as simple as that. And I think, you know, I always say that I copied my leadership model. I, my leader, I didn't know how to be a leader. I copied it off of the women of my community because the women of my community told people what to do. They had no problem telling people what to do mm -hmm. for the good of everybody. And that's why everybody followed instructions because they realized they could, they could feel it in their bones that the women were doing it for the good of people. So I, I do think there's, some, there's something about good that still passes through people and is still a powerful part of humanity. So. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your, your taking the time to putting together all the information and, and joining us for the presentation was terrific. Um, thank thank you. To... I'm sorry, but thank you huh. all. You're from a different part of the country and just having the interest, you know, and in cultural things. And, you know, I just would thank you for your interest, you know. And if you ever come out to Hawaii, you should pay us a visit. Thank you. We'll do that. Get a bit of exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> up on the mountain. <laughs> for everyone who, until until folks have a chance to actually visit Maui, visit the website. Um, they're doing great things. Okay, so I'll thank you to Art. Thank you Mahalo. everyone at DMNS for hosting the program. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us and for good questions. We will see you next month. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>